Okay, it is now um, 1.45, and so I resume the hearing. Um, are there any housekeeping or any other matters to pick up on? No, thank you. Um, in which case, then, um, let us turn to site LG3. That's east of Christian Sand Way and Talbot Way. Have I pronounced that right? Um, and what I'm going to do um, is, as previously, and take um, issues 10.11, 12, 13, and 14 um, from the council, first of all, um, before, before looking to others who are here to participate. Um, is that you again, Mr. Smith? I'm afraid so, yes. Um, so, site LG3 um, is a site to the east of Letchworth on land currently in the Green Belt, um, again under the ownership of the Heritage Foundation, who have confirmed the availability of the site um, throughout the process. In terms of highway and pedestrian access, um, there's a road, Flint Road, which runs to the southern edge of the allocation boundary and provides the opportunity for highway access. a little disguised under the sort of purpley hatching of... I, I can see it. You too, yep. Uh, safe and appropriate access for vehicles and pedestrians. Uh, yes, that's correct. That provides opportunity to, to get the highway access in. And again, no objections from the County Highway Authority um, to that proposal. Um, and is it um, creating an access from Flint Road that would um, affect the allotments? Um, no, I think that's if you were to come into the site from its west, you'll see there's, there's a number of sort of um, small roads and cul-de-sacs that effectively run, the allotment gardens run up the west, all the way up the west-hand side. Right. I know that has also potentially been looked at in the past, um, effectively re-providing a few allotment plots within the site and coming through that way. So th there is a potential alternate access um, but I don't think that's one that's being actively pursued. Although, obviously, if, if that were to be pursued at a, at a subsequent point, that would need to be demonstrated through transport assessments and so forth with any planning application. Uh, yeah, just, just, I mean, it might be to do with the scale of the map, but um, does Flint Road fully and properly join LG3? Yeah, I think it comes to the very bottom corner, and there's a, there's a gated access there, which which gets you into the, the bottom corner of the site. I don't think it involves going across any of the allotment plots. Okay, th there's no potential issue of ransom strip or anything like that? No. Okay. In terms of, of delivery and other infrastructure, there's, um, again, no other fundamental constraints um, identified. The site's allocated for approximately 120 homes, so it doesn't trigger the need for, for any on-site provision in terms of schools or such like. Um, through the infrastructure delivery plan, that the um, expansion potential of existing schools within Letchworth has been examined and there's sufficient um, potential to expand existing schools to accommodate um, the demand arising from these smaller sites and similarly the secondary schools. Um, and the local education authority has confirmed that those expansions are possible, is that right? Yeah, it's in the infrastructure delivery plan. I think it's also in the regulation 19 representations. There's a similar table that assesses the expansion potential 
of all the schools in the district in, in their estate. Um, obviously, decisions on individual expansions will be made as and when in due course by the Education Authority. Um, and, and the LEA does confirm that that is something that can um, physically be achieved? Yes. Okay. Um, I think you're going on to 10.2, Mr. Smith. 10.12, uh, yes. Uh, sorry, yes, 10.12. Um, again, the, the, the key issues that are set out in our Matter 10 statement for LG3, that's from paragraph 27 onwards on page 5. It states there, um, the site surrounded by development um, on three sides, so residential to the north, allotments with residential beyond to the west, and employment uses to the south. And to the east side, there's um, a tree belt along the significant majority of the length of the proposed site boundary. As with all the sites, it's been assessed and considered through the Strategic Housing and Land Availability Assessment. Um, Site-specific criteria are identified in the plan to address issues that have come up through the site process. So that's page 182 of the plan, which I think I can see you've got open in front of you. So there's a number of um, measures there to address um, those issues that have been identified through the site appraisal process. Again, none of which are considered insurmountable um, or, or fundamental, um, such as they would affect the principle of allocating this land. Um, so, in overall terms, um, our Housing and Greenbelt background paper summarises the reason we've selected the site, and that's set out in paragraph 31 of our statement. Um, again, it makes a, a contribution to our overall housing numbers achievable within the plan, and also a contribution within the five-year land supply period. Um, so, this one is squarely within the five-year supply? That's correct, yes. the housing trajectory which is in ED3 and which in turn informs that the schedule on our matter 6 statement has that completing in 2020 and 2021. Reasonable alternatives, I think we largely covered in response to our analysis of site LG1 earlier, but just to reiterate that we consider both those sites, LG1 and LG3, to be the only two reasonable alternatives for expanding Letchworth, excuse me, beyond its existing limits. Um, again, we've, we've used all the sites that we've identified within Letchworth. Obviously, Letchworth is identified as one of the main towns in the settlement hierarchy. Those, those factors, again, sit in behind a bit for our consideration of site-specific exceptional circumstances. So again, having established our view that those exist as a matter of general principle. As I say, LG3 is a potential early delivery site, so it can make a, an early contribution to housing needs, um, adjoining one of the main towns as identified by our settlement hierarchy. And we don't consider there to be insurmountable constraints um, on any other grounds. Again, as with LG1, um, summarised in Table A of our statement on page 7, 
site's been analysed against the four green belt purposes with an overall contribution of moderate. Overall moderate harm to green belt. Correct, yes. In terms of, of ameliorations, as I say, there's um, a pretty well-established tree belt along most of the um, eastern perimeter of the site, which will form the revised boundary. But again, we've got a requirement within the site allocation criteria to reinforce that structural planting along the perimeter of the site to ameliorate um, wider, any wider impacts on openness. Um, again, the, the assessment of the wider land parcels beyond the proposed site allocation show that that land um, that would remain in the green belt would continue to serve the purposes, um, notably in this instance in maintaining separation of Letchworth from Bulldog. presence of the tree belt um, and as reinforced as required by policy again we consider this to be um, capable of being an enduring boundary feature for the for the green belt as revised and that boundary is therefore consistent with the planned strategy and meeting identified requirements for sustainable development um, as we've said Letchworth is one of the higher order settlements in the plan and we've sought to allocate development to those locations in the first instance So finally, on the, the boundary, um, in our view, the, the existing green belt boundary um, is fairly poorly defined by the urban rural fringe. So you've got the allotments, the boundaries of the industrial estate. Effectively, it's, it's a little bit of green belt that juts into areas that have otherwise been developed. Um, effectively, it's a, a straightening off of the edge, joining those points. Anything else, Mr. Smith? Um, I think that's it for starters. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Sananda. I, I just inter wanted to pick up the school point because the closest school to that bit of land is St. Nicholas Primary School, but we have to take into account that's a church school, and so actually your ability to get into that school is um, based on whether you're willing to go to church for a requisite number of days as far as I understand or it was when my children were going to school. So it's actually quite a distance to primary schools. Um, I just thought I'd point that out when we say we've solved the school problem because little legs can only travel so far in a sustainable way. Mr Baker. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, I, only, I only want to make two points. Firstly to repeat the issue in relation to conclusions from the Green Belt Review about the uh, contribution of the area to purposes of the Green Belt and, the, and therefore the significance of and indeed the degree of impact on the Green Belt to point out that it, it, it is in our view not reasonable to conclude that the impact would be moderate. We consider it to be significant and that needs to be weighed in the balance. Apart from that, so um, our points are made in relation to this site <coughs> in, in the same way as they were on LG1 in our statement, and I just ask you to, to note those in your consideration uh, along with your, the other matters. So otherwise, I have nothing else to say on this site. Thank you.
So that's the same, Mr. Baker, in terms of the principles, it's the same, this, you raise the same points here as you do in relation to LG1. I, I, in yeah. essence, yes, sir. We do make a very a minor point in relation to the relationship to Norton Conservation Area and uh, whether or not this would actually effectively consolidate development in the area around that the Norton in terms of it being uh, considered as a separate entity. Um, but um, apart from that, I'll, yes, our comments were in, on the, in the same vein in terms of not considering that exceptional circumstances have been demonstrated for the development of this specific site. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Baker. Mr. Burroughs. Thank you. So this, this particular site, as you can see, is uh, north-ish north of the uh, LG2 site. And my grave concern with this is that the same uh, t development totally contradicts the principles we've made. Uh, I should explain that on the LG2 site, um, <coughs> it was all uh, the, the, the site, it's at the, uh, yeah, what would it be, east, east of the site is about three uh, quite well known lecturers' companies. All three said they were noisy and were often working uh, sort of into the night. And one of them said, well, their business is very smelly and into the night. And <coughs> what happened uh, on the development was that uh, the, the sort of cheap part, the, the flats, were put on the more or less uh, very close to the, to the factories. And... The issue of the noise was, has been solved by um, uh, telling, having double glazing and telling people, sorry, that they can't have, um, uh, they can't open their back windows, and if they do, they can't complain to the district council's uh, um, noise abatement people. Uh, and of course, the question of the smells wasn't even dealt with. But so this, to me, is uh, the kind of development that is totally contrary to the idea of distinct separation uh, between the noisy industry, smelly industry, and the development. Uh, I just w wonder whether there is anything that could be put in by yourself, sir, uh, as to, to try to uh, discourage this kind of development on LG3, because it, it's, it's totally contrary to our principles. Um, wh where are the businesses that you're talking about, Mr. Burroughs? I beg your pardon? The businesses that you were, you were talking about. They're at the back of... Uh, they're going... If you go into... Uh, what is it? Black Horse Road. Yeah. Then uh, first on the left is um, LG2, which has already been developed and is actually within the present uh, district council uh, plan. Oh, I beg your pardon. Thank you very much. <coughs> so that's one of them. Uh, and then immediately beyond that, that housing development, immediately beyond it, are uh, a number of uh, uh, factories where uh, the planning application for LD2, they objected at saying that um, if they're not careful, they'll have to move out if they <coughs> get a lot of objections made to the North House District Council uh, noise and smell abatement uh, officers. And so as a compromise, the, the planning committee uh, of North Harts District Council, as I said, agreed to something to, uh, to me was weird, uh, the, uh, the flats along that side onto the um, factories uh, and um, the, the uh, and the people that can't open their their <laughs> windows towards the factories, uh, and if they do, North Harts District Council noise abatement officers will will not um, uh, will not enforce it. Uh, it it's so that in a sense that they've got going to have double glazing. That's permission, but and and it just seemed to me to be typical of the way in what happens if one ignores our principle of a significant barrier uh, between green barrier between the um, uh, between between the uh, residential developments new ones and any industry roundabout 
do follow me. So it's, it's, if you look at LG2, which is on a corner between Green Lane and I think it's Black Horse Road, uh, the, it's, it's industry is immediately behind that on the left as you go, as you enter Black Horse Road. Thank you. Um, Ms. Barnes? Uh, my, my apologies. Had, had, you, had you finished, Mr. Burris? Yes, I have. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Ms. Barnes? Thank you. Um, I won't go through, again, all of my points about the heritage asset status of Letchworth and its Greenbelt, but the same points apply to LG3 as I set out for LG1. The, um, the additional factors here in LG3 are that the barrier or the, the land between the development LG3 and the village of Norton um, is now reduced to um, a very narrow area. Um, the local plan refers to the village of Norton, the 1996 local plan, but the current local plan ignores it as a village and says that um, it has merged, you can't tell where Norton ends and Letchworth begins. Where is it in fact, says that William, the village, one of the three original villages before the Garden City, William, to the south of the town, um, is still um, a separate village. And, and I question this, and I'd ask you, sir, in your own time, to look at the, the, the maps which show that William, whilst it still has um, fields around it, does have a very um, large estate, Manor Park estate, bordering it and bordering the road which runs from Letchworth Gate to William. Now the village of Norton is essentially the same as it was in the 17th century in terms of where the houses are located. If you look at a 17th century map, you could see that the three sides of the village sticking out into the countryside are still the same. Where the only link between Letchworth and Norton are the houses which have been granted consent to be built along Norton Road. I mean, they've been, they were granted consent some time ago. They are built. But they're only on one side of Norton Road. And so my argument is that the village of Norton and its integrity is just as important as William, and that by closing up the barrier, by or the boundary between the development of Letchworth Garden City and the village of Norton, we're in danger of losing that separate identity of that village. Um, I think in terms of the nature and harm, nature and extent of the harm to the green belt of removing the site from it, um, again, it's my I'd go back to the reasons I've given for my lack of faith in the scoring systems used in the Green Belt Review and the sustainability appraisal. Uh, and I don't think that the heritage status of Letchworth and its Green Belt have been scored adequately in all of those exercises. Um, I think that the under D, 1014D, the um, the green belt function would certainly be undermined by the site's allocation because the temptation to build between this current proposal and the village of, Le of Norton um, I think would be hard to resist on the part of the local authority. And again, I don't think that the, it would endure to the end of the plan period. I, I think one other point I'd like to make is that on the site LG2, which Mr. Burroughs has referred to, you'll see that there are development, there are some of the buildings there which are three and four stories, and I'd imagine that something similar might be put onto LG3. So you'd have these areas of very large buildings advancing towards this very small village of Norton over the fields. Again, on F, I don't think it's sustainable for the same reasons that I set out for LG1. I don't think it meets the environmental requirement. Um, the, on G, the physical features, I can't argue with those. There is a band of, of trees there.
Thank you for that. Is there anything um, else from um, this side of the table? No. Mr. Smith? Just to pick up on a couple of the points. Um, with regards um, to what people are referring to as, as LG2, that's actually unmarked on your map, sir. It's the, um, the large site that says factory, sort of right next to the um, purple employment area, just to help you get your bearings. Yeah. Um, so that was in a previous iteration of the plan, but because it was granted permission and subsequently built, plainly it's, it's not allocated in this version. Um, Mr. Burrows is right that on that site, and I think this is what makes it perhaps distinct from LG3, is that the residential properties do abut directly onto the rear of the um, employment uses next door, whereas at LG3 um, there is presently um, something of a, of a buffer between um, the employment uses and sort of more open areas of the site and without getting into sort of DM issues given the topography of the site which basically slopes from north down to the south the south may well end up being a, a more opportune place to put some of your green infrastructure such as your suds so I think there'll be reasonable separation between the uses um, I mean in in terms of the plan you'll see the second criteria we have for LG3 requires appropriate mitigation measures um, for properties that are in any way proximate to the employment uses so the plan makes allowances for that to be taken into consideration and similarly at the opposite end of the site to address Ms Barnes point um, the penultimate bullet point requests um, sensitive design or, or lower density housing where it may affect the setting of the Norton conservation area Are you indicating, Mr. Burroughs? Oh, sorry, I beg your pardon. <coughs> okay, is there anything else on um, LG3? Very good, thank you. And I'll move then to site LG4. Land north of former Norton School. Um, just to help you get your paper in order, um, the non-green belt sites we, we've done on a separate statement, so yeah. put that one to hand. Um, obviously worth bearing in mind now that all of these sites now fall within the current settlement boundaries of Letchworth, so they do actually, by and large, in it already have a degree of support from the current policy framework, um, obviously we're looking to carry that forward into the new local plan so um, again taking the questions in order um, you'll see on page one of our non-green belt site statement there's a table summarizing the deliverability um, of all the sites in fact that we're going to going to deal with and you can see from from that table the top row that um, that site's been confirmed available by the landowner that's the county council that's correct um, including access? Uh, yes, this is um, the playing fields of a former school site. The, the footprint of the, the previous building has actually already been built out, so again, there's a road that runs to the, um, to the site boundary. The south end. Say this again, my apologies. There's, um, there's a road which basically runs to the site boundary at the southern end, so Principal Court yeah. off Norton Road. So again, that provides the means of access into the site.
Yep. Um, again, all these sites are pre-shaped and we'll come back through them one by one, but if I just make a, a general point now, there's, um, again, no insurmountable infrastructure constraints identified on any of these. These are all now relatively smaller sites, so again, um, most infrastructure needs in terms of certainly education will be met off-site um, through the expansion of existing premises and, and as we've said a few moments ago in response to LG3, um, the County Education Authority um, have identified expansion potential within the existing school's estate to accommodate that. Again, on page five of our statement, we've set out a summary table with um, the key issues associated with each site. And again, that's um, largely reflected in the site-specific criteria that we've then set in the plan. So it's a playing field. It's a former school playing field, yes. Yeah. Um, I can't remember. I've got a feeling that we might have talked about this before because I was about to refer to um, this as a policy, um, LG4, but it's kind of not called a policy in the plan. No. It, we, we, we touched on this. We had a discussion. We? I think it was might have been at Matter 8 where, um, because the, the parent policy, I guess, which policy HS1, um, refers on to the site specific criteria and I think the agreement was that in the final plan we would then label these in some way as policy because they effectively become policy criteria um, yes I, I think that 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 needs to happen yeah. um, not least of all because the, the regulations um, refer to policies and um, justifications for those policies being in plans and and this is um, yeah it just needs to be more clearly labeled yes um, frankly so um, I'll, I'll carry on just I'll call it policy LG4 um, for now yes um, yeah um, yeah and presumably before all these bullets it needs to say sort of something doesn't it you know development of what approximately 45 homes sites allocated for development of approximately 45 homes subject to the following or something like that. Yeah. Um, justification for any loss of open space. Um, well, there will be a loss of open space, won't there? Yes. I just wonder why it sort of says that. Um, that was a matter, I think, which, which is largely resolved now. Um, the County Council have confirmed, um, I believe it's in their statements, that essentially um, there, there's no need to hold on to those sites for um, school playing field purposes any further, any longer. Um, they won't be needed as off-site playing school, uh, off-site school playing fields um, during the plan period. Yeah, because the so school's not, it's, it's not a school playing field because there's no school there. There's no school around. there and um, they've now clarified as a consequence of any expansion of, of the other sites. Um, not least because they're now some distance from that site. There's no need to retain those. Yeah, okay, well, look, you know, I, I understand that, um, but, but is, is the site an open space? So the policy says justification for any loss of open space, as though there, there might not be a loss of open space. Um, there inevitably will be, won't yes. there? Um, so, I don't know, it just seems to me that, frankly, the policy should say that, or, or it should say what needs to happen. I mean, are you seriously going to ask, are you going to allocate this site for housing and still require a justification for any loss of open space when that's what the site is? Um, probably not now, no. No, so, so that's probably wrong then, isn't it? Yes. Um, so the policy does, though, need to say reprovision or contributions towards improvements to existing provision where appropriate. Is that right? Uh, yes. 
reprovision or contributions towards improvements to existing provision, well, it will be appropriate, won't it? So it, so it ought not say where appropriate in, in case it might lead one to think that, well, there might be a circumstance where it isn't. Yes, I'm, I'm just wondering whether, whether it is, act, bearing in mind that it's a formal playing field and no longer required as a formal playing field, whether or not it is actually open space at all. I mean, obviously it's open in so far as it's not built on, but in terms of making a contribution towards open space provision in the technical term, in the technical way, whether it's actually needed. Because normally one would only have that sort of criteria in the Where policy. there's a loss. Yeah, if mm. there's an actually a loss of open space, which um, would need to be reprovided because the population generated by the housing will give rise to that need. And I'm just not, I'm just wondering whether this is required at all. I don't, I don't know what the open space analysis within the district is saying, playing fields and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, So would it be possible for just to park that and maybe then consider whether or not that criteria is necessary at all? Because um, if it's not, then it simply just comes out. Because, for example, L the other LG policies are not, don't seem to be indicating that there's a need for open space provision above and beyond what might be normally required on a, on a residential site. Mm. I think it comes down to the point of wh whether there is a loss of open space, doesn't it? I think, probably. Is that mm. right? Well, yeah, yeah, yes, whether it's actually being used as open open space. I, don't, I just don't know. Um, yeah, so w whether it fits one of the um, open space typologies. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, so I, I, I will need to know the council's Your note on that, view yeah. on that. Um, yeah, how, how can this... When you say park it, is that to do what, what I meant was produce a note as to whether or not we think a main modification should be the removal of yeah. that criteria or yeah. whether we think it should be retained once we've because it seems that it's all been driven by the playing field point where that's no longer a point and therefore whether or not the criteria needs to stay in the policy at all yes I mean and you, you'll appreciate that I haven't um, visited um, all of the sites by yeah. any means, and this is one that I haven't. Um, but if it's a site that um, a space that's open and green, yes. um, and the council wants to convince me that it's not an open space, um, you have to be very clear about why it isn't. Yes, I, I'm not talking about open spaces simply because they're greenfield sites, sir, because obviously no. all greenfield sites are open space. I'm talking about open space in the technical way of yeah. that it's meant in terms of whether it's needed to make a contribution to recreational amenity, which is required in the, di in, in, in the town. Mm. Be because we don't have this criteria for any of the other LG policies. Mm. I mean, clearly the site in its development will need to have an element of open space leaps and, and that sort of thing. It's simply whether or not there's a need for a provision over and above what one would normally expect to see on a residential site because of some wider deficit that the loss of this site is. I, I, I just think there might be at cross purposes here and I just mm. think we need to think about whether or not that criteria is you picked, you've rightly picked the point up, sir, so it just seems that we need to bottom it out. Yes. I, d um, I don't know whether the promoters of the site have got any view on that, but, um, but the, the way I read that is that it's going to the technical meaning of open space. Yes. And um, where is that set out now? It was once very conveniently set out in Planning Policy Guidance 17, wasn't it? Yes, um, yes it was. I can't recall off the top of my head whether that's made its way into the Planning Practice Guidance or not, I but... Um, I, 
don't know, sir, but we can. Yeah, in terms of the typologies, yes. I'm, I'm thinking. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, and you're going to deal with that by way of a note to me? Whether we think that criteria should stay in, and if so, why? And if it should come out, why? Uh, yes, I have a feeling I interrupted you, Mr. Smith. I have a feeling you might have as well, quite where we were, wasn't I? <laughs> <laughs> criteria MLG Yes, I think, yeah, you're right. We, we just pointed you to the, um, the criteria for the site um, in terms of, of justifying the likely impact of development. So. You were? Yes. So, as I say, we. we as with all the sites, we've picked up um, some measures which need to be considered in detailed scheme development. Um, then in terms of uh, reasonable alternatives, again, as we've said, uh, for all the sites at Letchworth, um, we have considered all the sites that have come forward in Letchworth that we consider to be reasonable alternatives are carried forward as allocations in the plan. Okay, um, I know the policy as well does also refer to um, addressing existing surface water flood risk through um, sustainable drainage systems or other appropriate solution. Yeah. Um, I just want to check, um, this is surface water flooding, is it? It is not flooding of the kind that no. might lead the site to be in a um, no, flood no, no, risk zone? No, 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 it's not a, not a sequential test site. No, it, will, it will have been picked up that there's an area of, of surface water flood risk on part of the site. Um, the site that should be addressed through sites. Okay. Are the likely impacts any or had you finished? Um, I think we'd, we'd finish, let's say, see the criteria are there um, for the self explanatory. We've obviously picked up its um, proximity of the site is near the Croft Lane Conservation Area, which is shown hatched on the policies map. So, again, just a requirement to um, have regard to any potential impacts there and on the heritage assets. Okay. Um, 10.13, reasonable alternatives. Um, yes, yeah, sorry. I just covered that a moment ago. As, as we've said um, to all the sites, we've allocated all of the sites in Letchworth that came forward and came through the process and out the other end as, as reasonable alternatives. Is anyone here to speak on LG4? Is that to, are you indicating, Mr. Burroughs, or have you just forgotten yes, to put I your... Am, you are, okay. Yes, Mr. Tell, Burroughs. Tell, tell me about that. Um, yes, this, <coughs> this concerns me. Um, in, in our garden city, there is a kind of social, I don't know, slight social difference between north of the railway and south of the railway. Uh, and one of the uh, things that is very noticeable in difference between the north and the south is the, um, are the, uh, looking at the south, you see houses 
uh, surround, surrounding um, spinneys, all, all sorts of greenery. Uh, and it, the north is uh, the railway is rather short of such uh, areas. And I personally would say, and our, our, our organisation would say, that it isn't an ideal opportunity for, for putting uh, or keeping at least part of a green area um, north of the railway. Uh, one of the difficulties here, of course, is that all what's happening is the all the uh, school playing fields of Norton School, uh, the secondary school, um, are gradually being built on. Uh, and, and that it reduce, very much reduces the number of open spaces, uh, uh, green areas, green spaces, to the north of the railway. Uh, and this is, I think, an opportunity. If you, I'm sure you, you've probably seen this anyway, the site, sir. Uh, and <coughs> you will find that it's, there's already there's some quite heavy, sorry, dense development, certainly not what I would call Garden City in any way. Um, and this is an opportunity of um, providing a, a bit of Garden City uh, in the middle of that dense development. And if you ask me what type, well, I would say it would be nice to have, for example, uh, um, uh, a green with houses around it, as you'll see uh, at uh, East Home, West Home, and so on. And, and that might be a nice garden city development. Um, but j just to repeat what's already there, I think it would be extremely disappointing and missing a good chance. Thank you, sir. Um, just, just remind me, um, would this site and all others in Letchworth be subject to a policy regarding incorporation of Garden City principles? Yes, it would. Um, I think it was at the design session that that was picked yeah, I, up. And I can't remember the policy number off the top of my yes, head. But I, I think it, it came out of that session that, yes, the, the design principles were going to be incorporated in some way into the plan. Was that through a main modification? Anything else from this side of the table? Mr. Coates. Just a quick point on the status of LG4. It has easy access from a road called Principal Court, which is um, on the uh, old Norton School site. It's been developed with quite dense housing. There is access to LG4 from here and I can confirm that it is used for recreation purposes. And uh, perhaps it'd be more appropriate still to put some goalposts and swings and roundabouts on it. Thank you. Anything else from the council? No, I don't think so. I say, as Miss Ormsby's offered, we'll just do a note to clarify the open space in the technical sense and, again, the relationship to our playing pitch assessments and the justification or otherwise for that criteria. OK, thank you. In which case, site LG5, land at Birds Hill.
this is a um, previously developed site um, currently in employment use is on the fringes of, of the Works Road employment area. Um, again, taking your questions in turn, as I assume you want to do. Um, this is a site with the freehold interest uh, lies with the Heritage Foundation again. Um, the position around deliverability is summarized again in Table A that um, various leasehold interests um, which are expected to expire over the plan period. I think this may have come up at, mat at one of the earlier matters where we said we were going to tweak the trajectory for this site from that which was shown on, on that original table. Um, yes, without the benefit of a straight edge. I'm, I'm not quite sure <laughs> which year it is um, on, on, on this table. Yeah, I think it's um, the fourth box, the fourth little box down. So it's in that second period, years five to ten. So we've got sort of 40 homes and a couple of years gap and then 46, but I think... Um, Following further representations from the Heritage Foundation, I think you just asked us to look again at that in the sort of the final trajectory because of the leasehold interests. Notwithstanding that, the, the site remains deliverable within the plan period. So in terms of highway access, obviously as, as a current site, there are, there's existing highway frontage um, to this site. So there's opportunity to create access into the site or, or utilize any existing accesses. And I think when we discussed employment before Christmas, obviously this will result in, in a loss of, of some employment land, but those losses from these residential sites are already factored into the council's um, consideration of how much employment land's needed over the, over the plan period. So the loss of the employment land is already factored in. Um, again, a number of site-specific criteria identified, um, picking up on particular issues that came up through the site appraisal process, notably from the proximity of this site to the railway. So obviously orientation of buildings, acoustic insulation and so forth will come into play. Um, risk assessments obviously for, from employ former employment use to um, ensure any contamination from previous uses is taken into account. And again, as the site's um, close to the conservation area, then again, sensitive design where necessary to ensure there's, there's no adverse impacts. And the retention of any buildings of historic and or archaeological architectural rather um, interest uh, are there any buildings of historic and or architectural interest on the site um there are yeah not not necessarily listed but there's certainly i think some early some earlier examples of sort of garden garden city employment buildings which may be possible to to convert rather than simply demolish and start again but again that's something that can be looked at in detailed design and, and planning as we go forward. Um, yes, I just wonder if for effectiveness the plan ought to say what those buildings are. I mean, presumably you know. Um, I think it's, yes, it's some of the, some of the original factory buildings on the, the northern side of, of Works Road, I say they're from fairly early in the, in the Garden City, so it could be that we specify those particular ones. I, sorry, I didn't catch that, Mr. Smith, my apologies. Just saying, as at the the buildings there, some of the buildings are examples of some of the earlier Garden City employment premises. So yes, we could specify any particular buildings if that would make it more effective. Um, well, yes. I mean, otherwise, one's sort of left wondering, isn't one? Is that a, a main modification?
anything else about likely impacts of the development? No? No. Okay, I'm not going to ask you about um, the reasonable alternatives because... Um, the record's getting stuck. Yes, absolutely, quite right. Um, is anyone else, to hear, uh, anyone else here to speak about LG5? Mr. Burroughs. Yes, thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, again, this to me is, is a rather strange proposal because this backs onto the, the railway and certainly it's quite noisy. In, I've been to some of these premises at LG5 uh, and um, visited them on business, but it's certainly quite noisy with, with the railway. And again, there is the problem of the houses uh, having to be, presumably again, they'll be told they can't open their windows onto the railway uh, and, and suffer from the noise because the district council um, and noise abatement officials would ignore them. Um, I, I, but again, it, it just seems the wrong thing. Here, one is encroaching on something which for a long time has been part of the industrial area. And Mr. Smith comments that, oh, within the plan, uh, but then on the other hand, I think to be chopping out these industrial areas uh, without, without really looking at what where the people uh, of the, what is it, the 1,000 or a few hundred houses, I assume that there's been no real survey as to where, where well, you can't do because they haven't got there yet, but it does seem to me that it's, it's, um, it can be deleterious, and I've said before that in my own experience there's a revival in, uh, um, around here in, in manufacturing. Uh, these premises are, I would have said, um, suitable for small manufacturing, uh, and that's what they were used to be for. So, so I'm not happy with that. Um, anything else, any other points on which you, you want to object on, on this site, Mr. Burroughs? Is no, it? No, thank you, no. Okay. Um, Mr. Smith, anything you want to say in reply? Um, just to reiterate that the um, site specific career criteria do um, require appropriate mitigation measures, and obviously, um, obviously, when you go to the site, there is already residential uses adjoining that site backing onto the railway. So. I don't think it's a it's a fundamental constraint. Anything else from anyone else on LG5? Thank you. Um, site LG6 then. Um, land off Radburn Way. Mr. Smith. Um, again, availability of the site confirmed. Um, the site allocation has shown in the submitted plan, there's actually been planning permission has been granted on part of that site. Um, that was picked up in document ED3. Sorry, um, planning permission has been granted on part of the allocation. That's correct, yeah. Okay. Um, so we would need to um, update the, the dwelling estimates effectively to avoid double countings. Obviously, those eight homes, I think, is that have been permitted are, are now counted in our supply. Have they been double counted? No, they haven't. In terms of ED3, we deducted what has been permitted. Okay. But obviously the plan still makes reference to 35 homes. I think whether that's a, an issue that needs remedying or... Okay. Um, or whether you're satisfied that as long as we don't double count it, it that's fine. Well, you have, to, you have to kind of treat it one way or the other, don't you? Um, are, are you proposing to alter the site boundary? Has the planning permission been implemented? It hasn't been implemented, so no, we weren't planning on 
changing the boundary. Right, it is, sim stage. It is simply that the permission given um, leads to a change from the 35 shown in what will be policy LG6. Yeah. Okay, and what will that change to? Um, well, if it's, uh, permission's been granted, I think, for eight homes, so we deduct that off and, and leave a balance of 27. Okay, I see. Well, yeah, I mean, that, that's not going to be a modification to the policy, though, is it? No, no sorry. It's going to stay in, in the, the policy. Yes. Yeah, okay. So it's just in terms of um, yeah. just housing so, so long as So long as it's not double counted that for, for in terms of the, the calculations, that's fine. Um, okay. Um, obviously, the part of the site that's been permitted effectively has a um, highway access approved as part of that permission, and that provides the opportunity um, to then gain access to the remainder of the site that yet has that has yet to gain permission. For the whole site. Yes. Okay. Again, potential constraints um, identified and reflected in the site-specific criteria. Um, as the plans progressed, um, it has been suggested there's a, a legal covenant on uh, the remaining part of the site which precludes its development. That's been thoroughly investigated by the Council's Estates Department and we can find no evidence of that um, covenant. So the council considers that that part of the site within its ownership, which is the, the part which doesn't have permission, is deliverable. Yeah, sorry, who's the owner of this site? It's the site split between the county council and the district council. The land in the county council's ownership is the area that's been granted planning permission and it's the area in the district council's ownership that remains. Okay, so in your view then there isn't a, any restrictive covenant on the land? No. Okay. As with all the sites, as I say, it's, it's been um, reviewed for potential constraints and where necessary site-specific criteria are identified um, against LG6. Um, yes, just looking at what will be the policy, um, retention of an area of priority orchard habitat within any scheme with appropriate compensatory provision for any habitat lost as a result of development. Mm -hmm. um, help me out here, what, what's a priority orchard habitat? Um, that is, um, as part of the site screening exercises, we looked at, I think it's Natural England's um, mapping systems, which maps a series of um, priority habitats um, of, of varying forms. And part of that site um, was denoted as, as having an orchard habitat on it. So the criteria basically asking for some of that to be retained or, or compensated for. Okay. So when I when I go to the site, I'll see an orchard there, will I? You won't now, actually, having been recently. A lot of that has been cleared. Right. I see. Much of the orchard's been cleared, I've just noted. Is that right? So I won't see much of an orchard. Right. Um, who, who owns that land? Uh, we do. Right. Did, did you take an axe to the site, Mr. Um, Smith? Not personally, no. Right. Well, 
Okay. Right, so where does that leave policy LG6? Well, we're not going to be able to retain um, the orchard if it's been removed, so um, I would have thought that would need to be amended to reflect the current status. Okay, um, so you can't retain it. Um, retention of an area of priority orchard habitat within any scheme well, you can't do that. With appropriate compensatory provision for any habitat lost as a result of development um, or mad axe men. Um, well, um, a priority orchard habitat that once was on land owned by the council is no longer there. Um, should this plan seek to do something about it? I'm just, um, what, what I'm trying to work with here is the, within the principle of the policy as it was originally drafted which was quite a bit about well look you know retaining the orchard um, or if we do have to lose some of it then um, providing compensatory provision um, are we left in a situation now where really this policy can only be about compensatory provision well, it would it would sound that that is 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 the position yes Would you like us to propose some wording, sir? Is that the best way? To yeah, I mean, there's going to have to be a main modification, isn't mm -hmm. there? I think just just to reflect, if nothing else, the reality on the ground. Anything else on likely impacts? Okay, I'm not going to ask you about reasonable alternatives. I'll take Mr. Burroughs first and then uh, Mr. Switzer. Yes, thank you very much, sir. Um, I must confess I'm extremely disappointed. The, uh, I get the impression that the orchard has been destroyed or something, therefore you can no longer see it. Is, is that, that, that appears to be the case. Well, that's shocking. I mean, one has to bear in mind, sir, that I came in to lecture the 6566 and the compulsory purchase order of um, uh, uh, Letcher Thurman District Council on the then new corporation, but the predecessor of our foundation. Uh, I, I was told by the council at the time that in the compulsory purchase order, there had been, it wasn't a covenant, it had been an order for someone like yourself that this land uh, had to remain a buffer uh, between the housing along there and the, um, uh, 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 and the land of the Jackman's estate. Uh, and that represents uh, uh, the kind of buffer that we always talk about in our Garden City. And I'm astonished to hear that it said there's a covenant because that doesn't tie in at all with what I was told, which was that someone like yourself, sir, on the compulsory order, can purchase order, ordered that that land should remain um, a green space, effectively, an orchard or whatever. Now, um, I, I don't know whether North Hearts has act could actually provide a copy of that uh, uh, order or that co well, it, it is. It wasn't a covenant. It was an order by uh, I think a, a, a government inspector dealing with compulsory purchase. And so I don't know. I don't think the council has. Uh, if it's knocked down the trees, I, I although admittedly they're, they're fruit trees and not others. 
I must. I would have thought they must be in breach of the of the compulsory purchase order. Uh, I mean, clearly that's not for me to decide. Um, but, um, Mr. Smith, um, do, do you have any knowledge of any of this? You, you say you've looked to check to see whether there was a legal covenant. Um, do we know um, for sure whether that? whether or not there is something attached to a, C a compulsory purchase order. Well, so so m m my understanding is that the investigations took place in relation to a point raised by Mr. Switzer that there was yeah. a um, restrictive covenant over the land effectively preventing it being built upon. That, as I understand it, has been fully investigated and there is no such covenant on any of the title documentation on, or indeed um, anywhere else. That, that's a separate point, I think, to the point that's mm. now being raised as to what was in the original compulsory purchase order. That, that I, I don't know. But yeah. Um, do you think that's something that ought to be checked? Well, um, I, wouldn't have, I wouldn't have thought so, sir, no, because um, and, and, and unless Mr. Burroughs is suggesting that under the, the compul uh, that there is some restriction over this particular site to prevent its delivery, that, that's what I understood he was suggesting. Um, what through the compulsory purchase order? Is this, uh, yeah. difficult, quite difficult, sir. Ha has council seen this compulsory purchase order seen it, no, relating no. to the land? I, I haven't seen it. No. 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 But could I ask that that be? looked into by the council because it, 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 it's it's in in my, in my view it would be in serious breach of that order for the council to have acquired the land which it did and uh, for the whole of Jackson Estate and then just to ignore an order that was I I imposed upon its predecessor unless with urban Well, th this is a new point that's being, a completely new point that's being now being raised um, by some. Yeah. It is not. I've, um, raised, it I've raised it already in submission I've made, submissions which I put so in. So is it just in relation, you're just suggesting, in, just so I'm clear, are you suggesting that it's just in LG6 that there is some sort of restriction preventing on development on, L on LG6? Yes, basically the compulsory purchase order. I was, it was only a few years. Uh, 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 after I came into our town, and I was very mixed up with the councillors and so on. And Did I was told that the, in the compulsory. If I, if I can help you out, Mr. Burroughs, yes. do forgive me. Um, the answer you're looking for is yes. What is it? it, it, it uh, the, the suggestion is, is that there, there is um, a, a, a restriction through the we'll compulsory we'll purchase yes. order. Yes, that's we'll right, have yeah. a look as best we can. Yeah. Okay, so um, the council is going to look into that, um, Mr. Burroughs. That, that was the, the upshot of uh, where we got to um, on that. Um, Mr. Switzer. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. I'm absolutely, utterly astounded by the response of the North Hertfordshire District Council. This matter of LG6, a three-acre plot of land between Radburn Way and and Baldock Road has been ongoing in terms of correspondence for at least 22 years. I fear that the council are not in full possession of the facts. Otherwise, I fear I, I feel that it would not be being discussed today. In the early 1950s, plans were advanced to build an industrial site and a separate housing estate in Letchworth which included LG6. In 1957, there were four objections to its development of what is known as the Jackman's Estate, which encompasses LG6. Those objections were upheld by the then Secretary of State, who refused to sign the documents authorizing the compulsory purchase order until agreement had been reached with the objectors. In a letter dated the 23rd of August 1955, Mr. Catlow, Hertfordshire County Council Planning Officer, writes to Mr. Plinston, Clerk of the Letchworth Urban District Council, 
informing him that planning permission for the 198 acres for housing has been approved, subject to the provision of a buffer strip, and raises the issue of preserving the privacy of the existing houses. The letter then inquires who would be responsible, would themselves retain and be responsible for a buffer state for agricultural purposes or as extensions to existing back gardens in perpetuity? Who would be responsible for the administration of this strip, etc.? Mr. Princeton is in no way ambiguous. It agrees to the inclusion of a buffer strip in order for the development to proceed. A letter to the objectors confirms that the boundary of the proposed residential development is set 210 feet from the rear curtilage of 185 Bulldog Road. And in Mr. Raindrop's letter states that the plot of land he leases from the First Garden City Limited, the then owners of the land, falls within the buffer strip to be preserved between the proposed town development and the rear of the houses of the Bulldog Road. A letter dated the 19th of May 1958 from Mr. Plinston, clerk of the LUDC, was sent to each councillor of the then LUDC, setting out the details of the inspector's findings and confirming the minister's decision on the two-part schedule as part of the CPO, approving the housing development but incorporating the provision of a buffer strip. The agreement was in perpetuity. For the benefit of the houses along the Bulldog Road, subject to their objections being withdrawn. The buffer strip was incorporated into the housing development plan and would run to the rear of the houses of the Bulldog Road and be approximately 210 feet wide and 1,200 feet long and would only be available for agricultural purposes or as extensions to back gardens in perpetuity. The buffer strip is referred to as LG6 and the local plan. The letter to each councillor confirms that the CPO, together with the agreed modifications and exclusions. This was not a vague promise, but a properly constituted agreement. On the basis when objectors withdrew their objections, the Secretary of State signed the compulsory purchase order. The compulsory purchase order therefore covers the buffer strip, but the town development plan excludes it. With this agreement in place, residents withdrew their objections and the Jackman's estate was built. The completed compulsory purchase order signed by the Minister of State comprised of a total of 218 acres. That is 20 acres for industrial use off Ignald Way and 198 acres for housing. However, modifications were made to the town development proposals and only 230, 215 acres were allocated for building works. The 20 acres for industrial use and the 195 acres for housing. The figure for the industrial use remained constant. The figure for the housing estate was modified. Thus, the remaining three acres is the buffer strip. This strip of land was included in the compulsory purchase order, but ordered, but excluded from the development of the Jackman estate. Years passed and the Letchworth Urban District Council became part of the North Hertfordshire District Council. The latter inheriting all the Urban District Council's duties and responsibilities, including the care of the buffer strip, which was by this time known as the sorry, this the care of the buffer state, which by this time was known as the buffer strip. In the late 1970s, NHDC authorised 33 to 44 Radburn Way to be built on what had land been originally designated for police houses. The NHDC plan was to build several chalet bungalows along a piece of open land to the south side of, but not on, the buffer strip. The NHDC Council honouring their obligation to maintain the integrity of the buffer strip. Circa 1980, numbers 35, 44 Radburn Way were built, finally sealing the western end of the buffer strip, which was now surrounded by properties. At some point in the 1980s, 1990s, North Hertfordshire District Council changed the designation of the buffer strip from agricultural land to zoned 
residential on the local development plan. This flew in the face of an agreement that the land was for agricultural purposes or as extension to existing back gardens in perpetuity. This change in terminology was made without the knowledge, let alone the approval of the residents abutting the buffer strip. During, the 1990, during 1996, it became apparent that a move was afoot to use the buffer strip for housing. The residents were not consulted and only became aware of this when people renting the allotments were given a one year's notice to vacate. The proposal was to replace Freeman House, an old people's home, which at that time was around 30 years old. The plan was to build old people's bungalows on the buffer strip. It was patently obvious that this was not the true situation as the buffer strip was far too large for such a small project and the residents suspected an ulterior motive, the redevelopment of, Buff of Freeman House merely being a cover for the development of the buffer strip. They believed there was a hidden agenda and this being to break the agreement and sell the land for housing. During this period, a neighbour, who was about to purchase a house backing onto the buffer strip and worked in the planning department of NHDC, asked for and was given permission to look at the records of the buffer strip. As he was only looking during his lunchtime, he did not get back to the archives until some three weeks late, three weeks after his first investigations. He found the archives had disappeared. At this stage, several residents, unbeknown to each other, took up the case with various departments of North Hertfordshire District Council. Each protester suffered delays and provocation. I myself had several pieces of correspondence with Mr. Brown of the Estates Department, in which in a letter dated the 7th, 10th of September 1996, he, re he refers to a restrictive agreement on the buffer strip, which suggests the Council Planning Department was aware a restrictive agreement existed. A further letter from Mr. Brown, dated the 10th of December 1996, states, as part of this process, a compulsory purchase order was made and confirmed by the Minister, but the Council decided to exclude from the actual development the land which we are now discussing. Messrs. Blinston's and Catlard's letters in 1958 clearly show that the Minister did not sign the compulsory order until all objections had been resolved. Mr. Brown also refers to the head of legal services' opinion that the buffer strip could be development, which I challenged in my letter to Mr. Brown dated the 14th of December 1996. On the basis, it was not an independent option. Uh, sorry, independent opinion. Mr. Brown did not respond to this letter, but a reply was received from Mr. Devonall, who says, I note what you say regarding the status of the buffer strip, I do not believe there is any discrepancy between us as to the fact, but merely as to interpretation of the fact. Matters continued to unfold until it became apparent that NHDC had a proposal to develop the buffer strip. This matter was submitted to the Housing Services Subcommittee on the 2nd of January 1997. The Housing Services Subcommittee was not made aware of any conflict of interest and voted to accept the proposals to develop the buffer strip. It is interesting to note that the NHDC officers were so confident that members would vote to accept the proposal that allotment holders within the buffer strip had been given notice to vacate in July 1996. In the minutes of the Housing Services Subcommittee, the 2nd of January 1997, the Head of Estates at minute 36 says, the order had been modified to exclude a small portion to the rear of 165 Bordock Road. Subsequent to the housing, sub housing Subcommittee meeting on the 2nd of January 1997, I received a letter from Mr. Devonold dated the 15th of January, indicating I should address all further correspondence to Mr. Bowler, Estates Department, Hertfordshire County Council. This implies that consent was a foregone conclusion, and although the matter had yet to be discussed by the NHDC Housing Services Committee and full council, the letter from Mr. Bernard makes no reference that a meeting of the Housing Services Committee was due to take place on the 21st of January to discuss this matter. Knowing that I would not be able to speak to at the Housing Services Committee meeting on the 21st of January 1997, I wrote to members of the Housing Services Committee on the 16th of January 1997 
setting out a brief history and concerns relating to the buffer strip, took it to the council officers and asked it to be copied to the members of the Housing Services Committee. Some days later, I came into possession of a document which concluded Mr. Cutler's response to Mr. Plinson's letter of early 1958. And I therefore returned to the council offices and asked that that documentation and letters could also be copied to the members of the Housing Services Committee. The receptionist told me it would be a lot quicker and easier to just send a copy to every councillor. I was happy for this to happen. In the document presented was the statement, for the benefit of the existing houses along the Bur Baldock Road, followed by a buffer state be incorporated in perpetuity. Before the meeting of the Housing Services Committee on the 21st of January 1997, my wife, Mrs. L. Switzer, decided to see if the councillors had received the documentation, so chose a councillor at random of the then councillors and spoke via the telephone to a lady councillor who said, I cannot believe this. I was one of the original committee set up to look at this proposal. When we asked for any documentation relating to the site, we were told there was none. Um, two, two things, Mr. Switzer. Um, I'm, I'm reluctant to, to interrupt because you haven't taken up much hearing time before now. Um, but um, I, I certainly get the general point um, that, that you're making. What I'm going to ask is, because you, you're reading from a pre-prepared note, could I have a copy yes. um, of that, please? Um, and, th and then I'll have everything that, um, that uh, you've wanted to say um, in, in, in writing as well, and we'll, we'll get a copy for um, the council um, too. Um, could, could I ask you to... Wind it up. Yeah, skip forward a few decades. Okay. <laughs> uh, but I, I understand why um, you've started started where you, where you have, but if, if you could, could bring me to, to the current time. Without reading from my script, um, in essence, the council have tried on six different occasions. Each time I've challenged them, for reasons unbeknown to me, they have withdrawn uh, any pos uh, proposal to develop. They have used the word covenant on, in correspondence to me, um, and I just do not believe that they have the right to develop this land under the current arrangements, which allows the buffer strip to remain in perpetuity unless they should choose to go to a court of law. The other matter I would like to draw to your attention uh, you mentioned, uh, or it has been mentioned, that they, uh, that the orchard has been modified. Modified is an understatement. It's been blitzed. There is no tree. There are no trees in the middle of the orchard any longer. Something like a minimum of 50, more like 100 trees have been uh, felled. They were fruit-bearing trees. They were part of uh, the habitat of uh, bats, which were there in February uh, 2017. The council uh, have told me that the bats no longer exist there, uh, but they've destroyed the habitat as well. That is a serious accusation. And I think I better leave it up there because mm. yep. I've said enough. Yep. Okay, thank you for that, Mr. Switzer. Um, and, um, yeah, I'll, I'll ask uh, Mrs. St. John Howe to get a, a copy of your speaking note and um, a, a copy for the council as well. Thank you. Um, yes, is, is there anything else that the council can say on, 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 on this point? I know you, you said that you're going to look into the question of the CPO. Uh, yes, as, as I understand it, the point that's made is that there's some there is some sort of legal impediment to the development of LG6 um, for residential use. Um, uh, all I can say at this stage is that certainly the council has investigated the title deeds to LG6 and there is no restriction preventing development um, of the land. W what I suggest that we do is, um, if Mr. Switzer you know, can provide a copy of the document which you've asked for, sir, we will simply just put a note into the inquiry setting out our understanding of the position. Um, I, I, as I understand it, the point that's made is that this legal impediment derives from the compulsory purchase order rather than some covenant 
that mm. exists subsequent to that. Um, I, I simply don't know the answer to that. We'll, we'll, we'll have, have, a, have a look and do our best to, to tell you what we think the position is. I, I don't think I can say anything more than that, sir, at this stage. Yeah, okay. Um, yes, well, I, it's, it's not something that we're going to get to the, the, the bottom of, um, certainly this afternoon. Um, Mr. Burrows? Just really quickly, um, could we please be provided with, with copies of the compulsory purchase order? The, the, the district council must have it. I, I, I know they took over. Sorry, Mr. Burrows. Yeah, if you could pull the uh, oh, microphone. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Could we please be provided with copies of the compulsory purchase order, which we're talking about? I assume the Secretary of State signed something saying that that would be a uh, buffer in perpetuity. Presumably, uh, North Hearts has taken over all the documentation from, from uh, uh, Letchworth Urban District Council, and therefore it shouldn't be too much of a problem for the District Council to find this unless, unless it's lost the documents, and then I suppose uh, we, we'd have to go back to the Secretary of State and ask for copies there. But I think it is important that we should know where we, everybody knows where they stand. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I, so I, I can't take points from um, people who are observing it, only from um, only from the participants. Uh, right. Okay. Um, I'm. If there is a legal impediment, um, what should that mean? the site well, well sir I mean it, it obviously goes to the deliverability of the site um, that's that's the issue as to whether or not this site can come forward in the next 20 years for residential development so um, beyond that um, I, I can't really say at this stage certainly my my instructions are that there is no legal impediment um, but I need to produce a document that sets out why we why we say that um, we will produce um, all the documentation that's that's relevant yeah. up to the points that has been discussed in so far as we've um, in so far as we've got them. Just so I can exhaust the, the discussion here um, while while we're here, yes. um, should it be that it turns out that there is, yes. um, that would would that mean the um, removal of the site from the plan? Well, I think the council would then have to consider um, what options were open to it to remove any legal impediment and whether or not it was um, minded to go down that route. And if so, how long that would take? So I'm not sure that's necessarily the end of the um, end of the question um, or end of the story. But at the moment, I, I, I simply can't say more than that because I, 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 I just can't inform you more more at the moment, sir. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Anything else on um, site LG six? Um, I have a feeling Mr. Burroughs might be about to indicate. <laughs> he sent notes all the time, sir. <laughs> Sorry, I'm being supplied with notes all the time. Uh, the town there. Oh, yes. These guys are going to supply them. Oh, I see. So, uh, yes, this is. Excuse me, this is given to me. You, you gave this to me. There's a gentleman here who says that he. He's been, oh, sorry, who says he's been to the town hall loft. The council have these papers because he supplied them. Presumably he meant copies. Uh, and uh, I can't read uh, this other one, about four stories and 20 maisonettes. Oh, that's the application, is it, yes. But, yes, this gentleman says that, he, that the council actually have the papers in their loft because he supplied them. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. And um, be sure to check the loft, Mr. Smith. <laughs> um, I'll go then to site LG8, um, Pixmore Centre, uh, Pixmore Avenue.
Smith. Um, thank you, sir. Yes, another run through the questions. Um, yes, the site um, is available. Again, refer you to the table in our matter statement um, where the development is promoted by the ground lessees, but is supported by the, the freeholder, which again is the Heritage Foundation. Um, so the site's owned by the Heritage Foundation. Is that right? Sorry, the other way around. Sorry, it's, it's, oh, our, apologies. it's our freehold, but it's on a series of long ground leases. So it would require our approval, um, but I believe that the people who are promoting the site are actually the uh, lessees of the land. Right, so it's available. Yes. Everyone who has any ownership interest is promoting it, is a willing landowner. Yep. Um, again, as previously, previously developed site, it's bounded by existing highway frontage on two sides. So, um, again, opportunities to create access um, for both vehicles and pedestrians from um, the existing highway network. Yep. Um, constraints, um, as with all the sites, considered through the strategic housing and land availability assessment and, and other relevant um, evidence. Again, um, as a site in current employment use, um, its loss has been factored into the council's um, approach to employment in the plan as a whole. And again, uh, a small number of site-specific criteria um, reflecting the outcomes of the council's um, site appraisal work. So as you'll see there, um, given the location and the existing format of, of development on the site, we think higher density development may be achieved. Um, again, given the proximity to the, um, the adjoining employment area, um, ensuring appropriate residential amenity um, within any development there, the need for preliminary risk assessment, and um, again, any uh, heritage impacts from the um, conservation area, the boundary of which um, abuts the western edge of the site to be taken into account. Okay, thank you. Is anyone here to talk to me about um, LG8? Mr. Burrows. Really just the same point, Mr. Chairman. I don't, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I mean, we, we've been discussing LG5, uh, like LG8, uh, and so on. All that's happening here is that, that they're proposing, uh, there's a proposal to build more housing for people to live in but actually to reduce the amount of places that they can work. This is totally contrary to our principles. In the past, I if, if North Arts District Council planning people who are much, much younger than I was, um, we've, I actually went uh, through the history of our garden city. They would find that every si for every significant new uh, development, uh, there was a housing development, there was always added to, to sort of to, to be in phase with it roughly uh, more industrial area uh, and um, th this has been happening all the time that I've known our garden city this is the first time I've ex ever known it being discussed uh, in, in, among lecturers authorities uh, that they should simply increase the number of uh, uh, housing amount of housing in our town and at the same time reduce the amount of uh, works at space that's it sir thank you thank you Anyth anything else mr burrows no, no, Sorry. Sorry. Um, i don't think we've got anything further to add on that obviously we covered a number of these points when we looked at lg5 a short while ago yeah so i mean I, I i have it basically that yeah. the same points from mr burrows apply and the same in principle response from the council. Correct, yeah. Okay. Um, anything else? Thank you. Um, I'll move then to um, site LG9. Um, former Lanark School. Um, yes, this is a, a four as the name suggests, a former school site which has been um, relocated elsewhere, leaving this site um, 
redundant. It's already been partially redevelopment, redeveloped. Sorry, there is a uh, current planning application on this site um, in the ownership of the County Council um, who had confirmed its availability and obviously the presence of a current application simply reconfirms that. Um, again, existing highway access to the, the frontage of the site um, on the White Way, which loops off Radburn Way. Okay, that's at the northeast as you're looking at the map. Mm -hmm. Okay. Again, is assessed in the same way as all the other sites um, in the plan, and again, um, policy criteria identified. Um, picking up on your comments in relation to LG4, plainly we'll have to look at the first bullet point again and the detailed wording. Um, so so I'll, I'll, I'll mark that as, as homework to, to add to the um, yeah. homework list. Yes, and uh, just to preempt, that'll be the same again on LG10 where we get there in a moment. So okay. if we wrap that up all in a single piece of homework. Um, so um, that is to assess whether or not um, it is an open space. Yes. Um, the criteria also identifying a need for lower density development and um, retention of some open space, basically given the nature of the site, it's in, in a slight bowl, I guess is the best way to describe it. Um, and there's also adjoining playing fields on the opposite side of the road, so effectively there's a, a bit of a green link um, in that central area of the Radburn estate. So the, the dwelling estimate for the site has been adjusted accordingly to allow that to take place. And again, um, a small area of surface water flood risk, um, but it's not a flood zone. Um, so again, site-specific criteria to ensure that that's addressed through SUDS. Okay. Um, is anyone here to talk to me on LG9? No. Okay, thank you. I shall deal with that as I have it in writing. Um, LG10. LG10. Um, no, sorry, bear with me. Former sorry. playing field, Croft Lane. Yep. Um, again, a, a former county, a county council, former school playing field site. Um, so again, availability for that site confirmed. Potential access into the site from Croft Lane. Um, you'll see on the, the policies map there's a small area of the allocation that sort of juts up to the north, which is an existing site access, um, and also further opportunity for pedestrian access to Cascio Lane to the west. Through the site's, um, site's appraisal process, um, as you'll see from the map, the, the hatched marking around the site today it's a conservation area. Um, so sensitive design will be, be key to this site. Um, and again, that's stipulated in the policy for the site. So sensitive design, lower density development, and, a, and again, a, a housing number that's adjusted accordingly to take that into account. Similarly, a requirement for the access arrangements to, to minimise any impact because that will be coming out into the conservation area potentially and similarly an archaeological archeologi survey. Um, it's been identified a need for that to occur prior to development by 
county archaeology, but again, it's not considered a, a likely to unearth a, a fundamental constraint. Mr. Burridge. Uh, I have lived in Letchworth for 45 years, and I bought my house in Croft Lane 11 years ago, which backs on to LG10 site. The appeal of the house at the time was it that it is, it is and still is within the Croft Lane conservation area, an area with grade two listed buildings and an area of special interest and <coughs> historical interest as recognized by Letchworth Garden City Heritage Foundation. Prior to buying my house in 2006, I made specific inquiries of the County Council and the Letchworth Garden City Heritage Foundation at the time over the old playing fields and was assured that they could not be built on due to the restrictive legal covenant that specified that only uh, the land could only be used for recreational purposes. Cro Croft Lane and Cashio Lane are, are lanes of, sig of historical significance and heritage to Letchworth Garden City. They are narrow lanes that currently struggle to deal with the current residents' traffic and, fl and flows. Currently, they struggle to deal with passing cars, with cars at times having to mount curbs and go on to uh, grass verges to, to get by. These lanes were built for horse and cart, not for cars, vans, or lorries. Croft Lane in particular doesn't even have a footpath from top to bottom. The lane is used more as a public footpath. The traffic flow is more from pedestrians than from vehicles, it being a cut through from the Grange to the Norton Village. On weekdays, there is a regular and steady flow of young children on their way to the Norton Infant School. And, sir, I would urge you to do your site visit between 8.30 and 9.30 on the school day or on 3 till 4 o'clock and you will see it for yourself. There is a serious public safety issue with this development. I have previously set on record in writing to both the Letchworth Garden City Heritage Foundation, the County Council and District Council, my significant concerns and fear that any development would represent a significant safety issue and concern that in particular do, through a construction phase there would be a death or serious injury to pedestrians in, in this development. The proposed development goes against local and national planning principles and laws as complete disregard for existing legal covenants not to be built on and in particular is flawed on the grounds of public safety. The proposed development would considerably harm and damage a conservation area, would considerably harm and damage an area with grade two listed buildings, and considerably harm and damage an area of special interest as recognized by Letchworth Garden City Heritage Foundation. Also, contra to Letchworth Garden City's heritage and funding and founding principles and significantly increases the density of housing in the area and surrounding area, as well as significant increases in noise and massive disruption to an area through the construction phase. Croft Lane and Cashio Lane were not built for such levels of traffic flow. A more appropriate option would have been for access to have been to be applied th uh, from Norton Road, which I suspect is the Council and Heritage Foundation's ultimate plan, knowing that access from Cashio Lane and Croft Lane is seriously flawed. However, even with the access that w had been applied for under uh, off uh, Norton Road, um, the, uh, the proposal uh, should still not be approved for the aforementioned points. There has been discussion today about open space. Uh, as a resident there, I can uh, assure you that the 
uh, land is used for children to play on and people walk their dogs on, that, on those fields. It is open space, green space, and something that it, a lecturer of Garden City and being a resident in Letchworth, I'm proud to be associated with. I'd also like to, like to put on record the hypocrisy of Letchworth Garden City Heritage Foundation's position on this proposed development, who have actively enforced legal covenants over residents of Letchworth Garden City for decades. As a Letchworth Garden City resident, you have to gain their, their approval for minor items from putting up fencing in your garden to the colour of your front door. But when they have a covenant over land that restricts the use for the recreational purposes only, they look the other way. The founders of the Letchworth Garden City Heritage Foundation put the covenants in place for, for specific reasons. The Letchworth Garden City Heritage Foundation's lack of action and response can only be down to a conflict of interest and other benefits they will obtain from the development. In short, you it's a disgrace. To, to go, just go to, a bit, bit careful there, Mr. To, it, it's a disgrace. It, in conclusion, there are many reasons as to why you should reject the proposed development on Norton School playing fields. Public safety is the one critical issue as well as the breach of local national planning and principles and the legal covenants that remain over the land. The impact on the local area is not justifiable. I urge you to do the right thing and to reject the proposal for the development. It's not sound, it's not effective, it's not ju justified and it's not appropriate. Thank you, Mr. Burridge. Mr. Burroughs. Thank you, sir. Um, quite a number of, uh, oh, beg your pardon again. Quite a number of points. Um, I would say that uh, I'm, I'm familiar with all of the old uh, Letchworth roads, I can say. Uh, and uh, Croft Lane in particular is the one that uh, seems to me to... to I identify what is or was the real garden city approach of the original um, developers and architects. And of course, if you if you go along there, you and I for, for, I've forgotten all the name, but uh, various quite well known architects, and I've forgotten them all. I think Mr. Hignett, I think, lived down there. Mr. Bailey Scott, I think, lived there, and they and they constructed their own houses, which I'm sure you've seen. So you've been down there, I guess. If not, so I beg of you, please, to go. But I think you will agree that it is something that if, if the founders of our Garden City came back to our Garden City, uh, the one they would see, find, gosh, that's just like the Garden City I planned, uh, would be uh, Croft Lane. Um, so, and also I think the, the proposal, you might have seen, I don't know, the, the, the planning application being put in by the County Council, uh, grossly overdevelops the site. I, um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to stop you there because... You're not considering I, I, that. I, no, it's, it's not for me to judge the planning application. No, thank so. you very much. Thank you, sir, yes. And so the, <coughs> the other point I think is extremely important, uh, and this is the uh, great crested newts that have, uh, I know reliably, because our, our foundation wouldn't do anything unreliable, uh, been found uh, to uh, breed in Norton Pond. Uh, you... I, <coughs> I don't, you, I don't want to repeat things you, you know all already yourself, but you, you will know, sir, that uh, the uh, Natural England uh, recommend the effectively that a survey of that, if, if something happens like that, a survey uh, up to 500 metres radius away uh, should be carried out. Now, 500 metres radius... Uh, um, Effectively, uh, uh, I don't. I, did, I think I did supply. Uh, oh, maybe it's. I, I don't know. But but anyway, I can assure you, so that 500 metres radius includes all of this uh, triangle of land, um, 
And therefore, I would have said that it is, it is not um, uh, deliverable in the sense that um, uh, North Arthur says nobody can uh, um, damage the, the, the habitat, damage the pond, do anything like that um, uh, without going to prison or being fined. And I wouldn't want to see um, uh, district council officials in, in prison. I visit them, but I wouldn't want to see them there. Um, the, uh, and so that is a very, very vital point, that until it's been determined whether there is that, uh, 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 w w I don't disbelieve our foundation, whether the European Union protected species um, uh, does exist around there, I'm certain, otherwise our foundation wouldn't have put it in. And secondly, uh, there's somebody I know well who I think will be, be talking there who his, his better half uh, assists on uh, taking the amphibians from Northern Pond across Croft Lane and they effectively distribute themselves uh, into the field and into the housing around the field. So I, I don't think anybody can say it, at the present time it, it is deliverable. Um, and uh, that is really it, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Coates. Yeah, the amphibians, Mr. Burroughs, uh, has referred to are toads. It is a significant wintering ground for toads. Therefore, this is a critical habitat issue. Yes, it is my wife who has been involved in a small group of volunteers who have been uh, making sure that these toads don't get, get squashed as they cross the road, cross Croft Lane to their breeding grounds in Norton Pond. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Coates. Um, Anything else from the objector's Sorry. side of the table, Sorry. if I can put it that way? You're, you're sat on the wrong side, Mr. Amos. <laughs> yeah, always, always. Uh, Mr. Flowerday, first of all. Thank you, sir. From, from the perspective of the Highway Authority, we've obviously looked at, at the, um, the proposals for this location. In terms of the, the quantity of development, um, the, the, the number of trips are, are not significant, so wouldn't have a, a major impact on the network. However, we have raised the same concerns um, as, as Mr. Burridge in terms of the application that comes forward. We would need to see um, how I, the... I don't want to talk about the planning application. I have to go very careful. Okay, it, It's not specific to, to an application, but just as in terms of general advice that we would give, um, we, would, we, would set, we would require that any application would that if it did come forward would need to look at how um, pedestrian movements along Croft Lane would be accommodated because it would be a concern for ourselves. Um, in terms of the actual physical access arrangements, they are deliverable. The, 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 the location in, on Croft Lane is, is relatively wide. There are uh, restrictions in terms of Cascio Lane because it's quite narrow, so the, the preference would be Croft Lane. Um, we've not, not had any discussions around an access onto Northern Road. So my, my question then is about safe and appropriate access into this allocation. Um, can a safe and appropriate access be achieved? In terms of an access, yes. Well, that, that's vehicular and pedestrian. Yes, um, so th there's sufficient room to provide an access there. As has been commented upon, there is no existing footway to the north, um, sorry, to the east on Cro along Croft Lane existing so the normal practice along that part of the route is to walk along the road as has been commented upon um, given the, the volumes of traffic that's not a, a concern for us but um, we would obviously try and seek an improvement to that situation if at all possible so um So in the view of the Highways Authority, um, th this site um, could be developed for housing as proposed through the plan? Correct, sir. 
um, and Croft Lane and Cascio Lane um, would still, in the, in the highway authority's view, would still would be um, safe. Well, I use the word roads, but you know what I mean. Um, safe highways um, for all users. Correct, sir. I just have to be careful to make the distinction. I'm not acting as the highway authority. I'm sorry, I'm not acting as Hertfordshire County Council, but as a site promoter here, I'm acting as the highway authority. Yeah. Um, Croft Lane um, would be safe, although for pedestrians, although there is no footpath for them to be on. That's correct, sir. I mean, it's an existing um, route that's used by a number of school children, as a, as Mr. Burridge suggests, um, and there's no accident history along that route. Okay, just to make sure I've got this right, Norton School is in Norton, is it? Norton Infant School is in the uh, in Norton Village. Yeah. Okay. Saint Nicholas. Saint Nicholas's School. It's called. No. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Right. So children walk along Croft Lane, um, and then to Norton Road, do they, up to the school? There is a cut through from the Grange, uh, which comes up uh, Croft Lane, and uh, to go, and then you walk down to St Nicholas's School. So it takes all the children from the Grange uh, mm. along that route. So there's a, f a steady throw flow of children that walk through there. I understand. I can I see that route now. Okay. Um, I have on the one hand um, some people telling me that that um, situation, that arrangement is um, not safe and not acceptable. I have um, the, the opposed view from this side. You're, you're not going to agree. I'm going to have to decide for myself, aren't I? Is that about the size of it? Um, yes, it is. Um, I mean, appreciating the, the desire line towards the school, which also point out there is a, a secondary potential pedestrian access out onto Cascio Lane which is shown on the allocation at the south west corner you can see there's a thin strip that juts out there yeah. and obviously that connects onto existing footpaths and round I'm not sure how that is relevant to children coming from uh, the Grange going to school, they'll take the shortest line of route, which would be up um, Croft Lane. Yeah, OK, well, you look, you know, I, I can see what's what um, on, on the plan, and I will see what's what um, on the ground um, as well. Um, did you say, Mr Flowerday, that... Um, some kind of footway along Croft Lane would be desirable. Did I hear that right or have I just misheard? Um, no, that's correct, sir. Um, I think we would look to explore all avenues as to, to what, um, we could, what could be delivered along the route to make it as safe as possible. That would be normal for our development management processes. Um,
desirable but not necessary for safety? I think it's about the environment, sir. So we'd need to try and ensure that the environment was suitable for, for pedestrian movements, um, all modes, using that, that route. Um, so one way of achieving that would be to, to, to implement a footway which would pr provide some segregation. Um, but there's other options in terms of looking at the speed limit along the road. Um, we have shared surface arrangements in other locations. So there's a number of options that are open um, to for further exploration. Yes, I mean, I, I dare say that if one put one's mind to it, would, one could conceive of all kinds of things. Um, the, the, the question is whether or not it's necessary. Um, is it necessary um, for safety reasons? I believe that it would be necessary to look at that location and to come up with a solution to make it acceptable. I don't think we would um, want to just have the development and just allow people to come out of the site um, onto the Croft Lane in, in its current condition, although there are alternative access routes um, out of the site like have, have been mentioned. Um, however, there's a desire line to use Croft Lane. Yeah. So are you saying that something has to be done? I think that's the position on, of the, on, on of the Highway Lane. Authority at the moment in terms of our advice would be that we would, we would seek to secure uh, an improved situation along Croft Lane. Um, yes, but you can only do that through planning means if it is necessary to do so, which is why I'm asking you, is it something that's desirable um, or is it necessary? Look, cut, let's, mm. is this a safety issue or isn't it, in your opinion? I've heard quite clearly from one side of the table, they say it's a safety issue. What does the Highway Authority say? I'd say as it stands, it, it isn't a safety issue because it's the exact same situation. The number of movements are not going to be massively increased, but we would want to try and secure improvement if at all possible. I'll come to you in a moment, Mr. Burge. Mr. Mr. Burroughs. Uh, from what I just heard, uh, the answer seems to be that, uh, that there would be no safety issues if one effectively uh, inserted a pavement uh, along the whole of Croft Lane. <coughs> First of all, sir, that would destroy completely destroy the quality of a road which to me is symbolic of our garden city. And I, Paul, and I can understand uh, the views of highways engineers. My brother is a highways engineer and I always tell him he has to be more se sensitive in these things. Also I've been passed a note uh, I can't guarantee it's 100 percent correct. It does say that. Is this um, is this something that stems from your original representation, Mr. Burroughs? This, this is this sir, is to do with well, uh, crop no, lane uh, and, and, and safety and safety. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's it's answer an, answer my question. Is this something that picks up on uh, uh, your representation? Yes, it's a safety. It's, so, it's, so, it's something that you have mentioned in your representation. Yes, basically, uh, the okay. access and everything. Yes, that's right. The, the, it says, this note says that Croft Lane is between 3.8 and 4.7 metres wide and that Hart's uh, Highway Agency says there has to be a minimum of 4.8 metres to serve up to 50 dwellings, which to me, again, implies damaging uh, the value of the Croft Lane. Thank you, sir. Mr Burridge. I, I, I find it quite astonishing from uh, a position that saying that a path is not um, uh, uh, required along Cross, Croft Lane. Um, 
it would undoubtedly be required to give safety and reassurance to parents and users of Croft Lane uh, and the Grange and the children using that road. It, to put a path in would significantly reduce the width of the road even further. There are hedges on one side which I understand are protected, so you can't, you can't have, uh, take any width from the other side. And to come up with a position that they'll look at it at some future point is quite frankly not acceptable. The, the reference to the fact that there hasn't been a path or uh, there hasn't been a, uh, an issue in the past or an accident in the past and therefore there isn't one in the future is quite frankly ridiculous. During the build phase of a two year period for such a, a site, there are going to be large juggernauts and lorries and vans coming down that road where there are no, there is no path and a steady flow of children. There is quite definitely a safety issue here. And as I've said previously and put in writing before, there will be a death or a serious injury if this goes ahead. Well, so, so as un obviously that, that can be managed through condition in so far as when construction traffic comes in and out of the um, developed site over the period of time that the site is built out. But as I understand it, the position is, is currently that children are walking from the Grange estate along this road to the school. And um, there has been no accidents recorded and no doubt if the uh, highway authority were concerned about the safety of that then they would have done something about it but they have not all that um, the district council is proposing to do is to um, introduce 37 more homes into this site will give rise to potentially some additional um, movements by children to Norton which I would suggest is likely to be small scale in the light of the children that are currently using that route in any event but at the development management stage if there is a real concern because of the additional children that are generated from this site of primary school level then that could be sorted out at the development management stage but as I understand it the highway authority is saying that that would be an improvement but not a necessity but that will be worked out at, 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 that, at that time. I mean, that, that was my understanding as well yeah. of um, where Mr. Flower Day arrived at. Okay, is there anything else I need to um, know about LG Tech? Mr. Mr. Coates? Yeah, sorry, could... Uh, the fact that there is no safety issue now is prior to there being a load of new houses to be built. And if there was, how many houses? 37, was it? That's quite a few more children. That number of houses, quite a bit more traffic. So whatever the margin of risk now, it will go over that margin and we go into the safety issue then. That is an obvious point. You can't argue that because there's no safety issue now, there won't be one in the future when there's going to be a very different change of circumstance on that road. So, final point, Mr. Burridge. This application fails on on two passes here. To build on that that point, there is there is the issue of once the houses were to have been built, would there be more more flow, and and and, and uh, route people coming in and out of Croft Lane that would increase the risk, and there would be undoubtedly, and there is an additional uh, risk that is attached to that. The bigger is issue, and I do not accept that it could be managed through a build phase of two years, is that the, 
the, the um, juggernaut lorries that would be required to bring in materials to build 40 houses on that site during that phase will not be able to be controlled and without a path there represents a significant risk to the safety of many. The, the reference to the past is irrelevant. It is what would happen during that two-year period that would be important. And the road is fundamentally, it's not even a road, it's a lane, it's a windy lane, is not wide enough to deal with the traffic. The current residents, there's only uh, uh, relatively few houses there. Yes, they do go down there um, at, 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 at slow speed and they're courteous to walkers of dogs and children there. Um, workmen who are building on that site would not necessarily operate on the same uh, basis and the road and the lane is just not built for that level of activity. So it fails on two measures, the short term, two year period, and the long term. Okay, thank you. And anything else on this side of the table? Very good. Does the council have anything else um, to add? Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, rather late in the day, I'm going to take the um, mid-afternoon, well, mid-ish um, afternoon um, break now. Um, yes. Are we, are we going to deal with Royston today? Uh, <coughs> the optimist in me says yes. Um, we've got four sites left yeah. without doing the examination of now, which are all sort of previously developed sites, um, hopefully relatively non-controversial. But um, we'll see. Um, so yes, I think we can we can get on to Royston. When we get to Royston, I think there's a number of sites with applications or, or permissions. So yes, th th that there's does a help th move th through. There's a reasonable chance um, that we might get onto Royston. What, what I'll what I will do um, to accommodate people is to hear from those that have come to talk on specific sites um, in Royston um, first of all. Uh, rather than necessarily just taking them um, in order. Um, so um, I make it um, 16.02. I'll adjourn the hearing to resume in this room at um, 16.20. Thank you.